Hey, listener. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Banter Banter. You're listening to part three of our Scott Pilgrimage special. So just to make sure you're caught up, be sure to listen to the last two episodes on the podcast feed. Enjoy! Kim! So we have Wallace and Scott the next day. Scott is leaving a message on Ramona's phone. And then he walks into the kitchen and whines to Wallace. Wallace goes, you can't say you didn't see this coming. Scott seems kind of shocked. He goes, what did you think these were? As he pulls the phone number that is hanging off the side of the refrigerator. Off and underneath it are seven X's. And he says seven deadly X's. Scott seems very bewildered and confused. It's like it doesn't comprehend in his head. And then he slumps down. It's like, why does everything happen to be so tough? Wallace rallies the troops. I almost think that there's a tiny moment in his head as he's saying this. That he is on the back of a horse with his face painted half blue, waving a sword, shouting at a bunch of Scotsmen. Well, if you notice, they even build it up with some underlying music. Yes, I love that little touch. That was fantastic. I really loved it. And I love how they used the leg slap to cut the background majestic crescendo. Ah, you get it? He gave a rallying speech to the Scots. <laughs> well played, sir. To add to your analogy. Ah, uh, I love it. One might say that these particular Scots were pilgrims. <laughs> Wallace looks at Scott and crouches down. If you want something bad, you have to fight for it. Step up your game, Scott. Break out the L word. And... Lesbian? No. The other L word. Is this foreshadowing? I definitely think this is a bit of foreshadowing. Of course it is. It's Edgar Wright. It's great. It's the problem of where Scott's mind goes when somebody says the phrase, the L word. To wit, you get Wallace's response. It's love, Scott. I wasn't trying to trick you. Hey, buddy, look. If she really is the girl of your dreams, then you have to let her know. You have to overcome any and all obstacles that lie in your path. You can do it. Be with her. It's your destiny. And then, leg smack. Crescendo ends. Plus, I need you to move out. I love how Wallace kind of, like, props Scott up to just knock him back down. Uh, hey, man, you're also being evicted, but I don't want to actually evict you. Well, and I think it goes to show that his whole encouragement talk was definitely to try and put some wind back in his sails so he wouldn't feel as bad when he evicts him in a few weeks. Yeah, or the hopeful chance that Scott ends up moving in with Ramona. Totally agree with that. You know, if you apply the hero's journey template to this film i would definitely say that wallace is the wizard character oh really it seems almost every interaction between him and scott gives scott some sort of insight now while they do paint this in this sort of like catty back and forth thing that he does it always seems to be to add clarity to scott's situation or to ground him with what's going on yeah he definitely does seem like the sage type and his interactions with Scott. I would totally agree with this statement. Wallace always provides confirmation or reality checks to Scott. Well, and if you notice in most heroes' journeys, eventually there comes a time when the wizard is no longer able to help in one way or another. 
for example, in Star Wars A New Hope, there's the point where Obi-Wan loses to Vader. And not to try and draw an immediate parallel to this, but you can definitely see that Wallace is being phased out as he is wanting Scott out of his home life. Get out of here, Scott. You're taking up space. There's always a certain point when the sage, the wizard, the wise man is removed from the hero. So the hero can basically come into his own. I would definitely agree. The more you talk about this archetype, the more I'm getting behind it. The next thing that happens is the phone rings, and Wallace suggests that this might be Ramona, and encourages him to go get the phone. As it turns out, it is Scott's previous big breakup, Envy Adams. Ba 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 bum. Oh shit. Again, because this involves characters we're not talking about, they introduce her presence back into Scott's life, and she's obviously going to make an appearance in the coming day for Scott. Now, the conversation happens, it ends. And Scott hangs up the phone. He just kind of holds the phone in his hand, and Wallace puts the receiver and says, okay, everything does suck. Then the phone rings again. Or does it? So he answers it. Hey, Knives. Yeah, and it's Knives on the other line. As he rushes to answer it, Scott scrambling to find a place to hide. Wallace pulls the door closed a little bit as he responds, Oh, Scott? Scott just left as he literally dives through the window. Like very clearly, completely visible to Knives. Just shatters the window. And jumps back in to get his coat. Right. As she reconfirms, Oh, really? And Wallace comes back with, Yeah, you just missed him. As he reaches back into the apartment to grab his coat. Pretty solid. She obviously knows. She's not an idiot. And you can kind of put that together because when she responds to Wallace saying that, the camera turns to her and you can see Scott fast walking down the sidewalk behind her. And you can see her eyes shift. She never fully turns her head behind her, but they shift like she she knows. knows. She knows. So this prompts her to kind of shadow Scott a little bit. Scott makes his getaway and has his first encounter with Roxy. You think that this is the beginning of another Evil X fight? Or if this is your first time watching the film, then... You don't really know who this is other than some other assailant, but she has all the calling cards of an evil ex. Exaggerated attack skills and stuff. I did enjoy her dropping the line, I'm deadly serious. I think giving you a small taste of what the future might hold. We'll just call it an introduction. So the two of them have a standoff and Scott points out that he is not in the mood right now. And she yields to that, and Scott goes on to track down his sister at her work. It turns out that she was either trying really hard to get away from him, or this really just was the end of her shift, but she basically ghosts him, just kind of letting him know that she has to go outside the window as she's already leaving. Another interaction happens, and we then have Ramona show up, surprisingly or unsurprisingly envy also happens to show up at this coffee shop and then she asks scott to show up to this secret show that they're going to have a bit of exposition gets dropped as we then have ramona and scott talk about envy's place in all of this and scott kind of dodges where she's coming from and everything as they are walking outside for a bit, and the conversation ends in an offshoot manner, Ramona inviting Scott to her place. This cuts away to the next scene where it is clear that Scott just talked about the whole situation to Wallace back at the apartment. I think this is kind of an extension of Wallace slowly trying to be removed from the situation or separate themselves from the hero trope as the wizard in the sense that 
the first person to sit up and respond to Scott is what you can only assume to be probably Wallace's boyfriend at the time. It was the kid that he stole away from Stacy back at the first fight with Matthew Patel. Oh, okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. We have... A four-person smorgasbord all sharing the bed, which is Wallace's way of saying, Scott, I need you to move out. It seems like Wallace is definitely trying to move into the lifestyle that he would prefer to have, and it's becoming increasingly clear that there is less and less room for Scott Pilgrim to be in this picture. Scott needs to have a story without Wallace. It's okay, man. Sometimes you just have to move on. Scott is then beckoned to leave, at which point he goes to practice, where we immediately find out that, again, Stephen Stills has sniffed up another prospect for a show for them. The show happens to be being the opening band for The Clash of Demon Head. The scene opens up with him explaining why they have to take this show. Scott obviously isn't very happy about it, Stephen goes back with saying, a gig is a gig is a gig. As he opened up with the line, hey, I have some news for us. And this comes back with Kim sarcastically dropping in, is the news that we suck? Because I don't think I could take that. Oh, Kim. Such a straight face. So Scott is trying to come back with the thought that maybe they don't need the secret show and asks, why can't they have their own secret show? Which Kim comes back to with, all of our shows are secret shows. Because nobody knows who we are. I feel like it's more dry banter on Kim's part at this point. It seems to just sort of add to, I guess, the building discontent with the band and maybe the way Scott isn't making it his priority. How the band never felt they were doing too well to begin with, but... This and Scott's drama is definitely not helping them in being able to get ahead as a group. I mean, I feel like at this point that Kim is pretty cemented in who she is. Right. But I definitely think that a lot of her comments are to mirror the sentiment that she doesn't feel that any of Scott's drama has helped to make them better as a band. Oh yeah, definitely. Her remarks are very scathingly towards Scott, very much so. And then rather than having the attitude of trying to do it to maybe incite the band getting better, it seems like she's resigned to, well, this is who we are. Yeah, just mediocrity. Which then brings us to realize that there's somebody eavesdropping onto their conversation. The timing is great. I love this timing. Maybe not so much eavesdropping as Eve's peeping. We got my girl Knives. You mean Stalker? Yes. From her earlier situation with Scott, who obviously jumped out the window as avoiding her, for someone who misses her ex, she wanted to check up on him, it would seem, at night. So she peeked through the window and saw something truly distressing, and that was Scott laying his head down on the shoulder of his new girlfriend, Ramona Flowers. You gotta give it to him on this chop-in. The band is discussing what's happening. The lead, he's complaining about the things that they need. We need secret shows that nobody goes to. We need stalkers. And that's when you get knives in the window, stalking them. Particularly, I love how during this whole section while they're talking, a young Neil is playing one of the Dark World dungeons from Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. I did not catch that. As soon as he says, we need stalkers, and it cuts to knives in the window, you hear the fanfare from when Link gets an item from a chest. Da-da-da-da! Ah! Well, it definitely struck a chord with me, and I liked that cut over to this moment of knives. And then what is about to ensue with her reaction based on what she just saw and couldn't hear, but the knowledge from the audience of the conversation that Scott and Ramona are having that Knives is watching. 
So all Knives is seeing is just Scott's leaning on another girl and finding comfort in another girl, which sends her into a very jealous rage. She goes home to a friend who she was venting to. She grabbed a box of blue dye and was complaining to her about how he's dating this fat American girl. Yeah, that was nice. Who's so old, like 25 or something. (laughs) So she's upset and now she's trying to win Scott back by imitating Ramona. I love some of her comments throughout that whole scene, like, How she says, this isn't fair. I didn't even know there was good music until a couple of weeks ago. So there's one point where she's just in the tub, like washing the dye out of her hair. And her friend says, like, I can't hear anything that you're saying. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, when she puts the dye in her hair, it starts burning. Like, and really, honestly, I feel like Edgar Wright maybe captured what it's actually like for girls to complain to each other about boys. And how stupid we can be. So that whole sequence was very fun to watch. And she washes the dye out and dries her hair. And only half of her hair is blue. She kind of did like a six o'clock to midnight on the left side of her head. And she liked it. She said she thought she looked good. And then she devises a plan to get Scott back, which includes... Texting young Neil, telling him he's so hot. Oh man, young Neil, you are so hot. Mm, The anaconda is on the prowl. Watch out, lest you get caught in her coil. The scene then moves on to the night of the show, where, if you notice throughout the end of that sequence with Knives, you could hear, I really honestly don't know what the song is called other than what Scott called it, Launchpad McQuack. Right. So most of that song is playing in the background leading up to the transition that is another nice piece of Edgar Wright editing where you realize that this is the song that they are playing at the show. So another lackluster performance. Steven can't even bother to properly ask the audience to buy their merch. Just trailing off halfway through a sentence that they have merch in the back. And then he stops. Bar? Now? Bar now? Now bar? Everybody is gathered, and it seems that mostly Steven is more caught up in how he's just being another neurotic mess, which kind of leads to him asking if they're any good, and Ramona comes back with, I don't know, are you? And she goes to the restroom. Which is a great chiding moment. I know we're not technically trying to pick her apart but i feel like either she is saying that yeah maybe y'all aren't that good or maybe she's trying to point out to steven that he is being a neurotic mess right now and the great thing about ramona's character is like i don't know if there's any way to actually suss that out because of how she delivered it it was so evenly toned that it could have been scathing or it could have been uplifting Which leads us to the payoff of all of Knives' prep work as Ramona goes to the restroom. She hears a small voice from behind her say, Hey, Ramona. And she turns around and sees Knives. And just another little awesome editing trick that I love is when she locked eyes with Knives in the mirror, there was a brief moment where the lights flickered, like as if it was some sort of paranormal presence. Wow, you know, I totally didn't catch that one. Yeah, no, there is so, God, it's just, oh, it's candy. I could eat this movie up for days. It's great. (laughs) That does not sound like a healthy diet. No, it's not. Plastic DVD does not feel like it's going to sustain you for days. You might have internal bleeding. I suggest you go to the hospital. Mmm, get me some forks. Devour the plastic. Oh, (laughs) God. I'm going to gobble up that jewel case. So there's an awkward interaction, and Ramona responds saying, Hey. And she turns around and says, What the hell? And walks out. Knives follows. And as she's walking out of the bathroom, she kind of pulls her hair back to the side, like runs her fingers through it. And then you see Knives imitate her actions. So Ramona walks back up to Scott, and then everyone notices. Knives going directly up to young Neil and giving him a big frontal hug. 
And then a conversation happens between everybody about knives and how Scott knew her and that they used to date. And then Ramona made the comment like, how old is she? So is that what people call it these days? A frontal hug? I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. Like some... Like, do I have to think about a side hug or a back hug? Sure, exactly. Maybe an upside down hug? There are different kinds of hugs. There's the side hug, the back hug, the full hug. What if I just want to give you a foot hug? The arm bar, the full Nelson, the suplex. These are all valid hugs. The clothesline. Clothesline is my <laughs> favorite. When you run up to hug them and then they just put their arm out and just like chop your neck. The rock bottom where you put one arm over them while facing them. Then look at the crowd and raise your eyebrow and then just like jump and slam them on their back. Yeah, that's the most fun. I was going to go with the figure four hug where you wrap their legs up and you make them squeal as you hug them because it hurts. Maybe the scorpion hold. And talk about hurt. Right after that, Clash of Demon Head takes the stage. And crushes it. As they have what I would say is, I feel like the musical acts that our sex bombs have to contend with do get increasingly more intense and better. So this one's definitely a summary of the type of music you would get from a record label marketed band. Sure, it definitely sounded very grungy garage music. But yes, definitely sounded more professional and industrial. Would you guys agree that some Brie Larceny hacked on the stage? I would clap, but then we would mess up the edit and accidentally start here, but I'll do it anyway. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, Your claps make <laughs> me more powerful. We have their musical number play, and after that, Steven goes right back to being a neurotic mess, as he almost felt like this was a direct competition, where he thinks that they were blown out of the water, despite the fact that they were just the opening act by request. When has anyone gone and seen an opening band outdo the headline? It's probably happened on occasion. But I do not see that being a frequent interaction. The reason they're the headline is because that's what everybody's there for. It's okay that the beginning bands that open up don't get, like, a raving crowd reviews. And in my experience, it seems to be that whenever it's definitely a much larger mainstream band with much smaller opening bands, the production in my concert going career seems to be that they ran the main band through sound check, so all of the equipment is prepared and tuned for them and not for the opening bands. Oh yeah, would totally agree. So that will definitely kind of stunt everyone's perception of opening bands. Yeah, cuz believe me, I've gotten to concerts early like at, you know, dive bars and sometimes sound check can last for two hours. There's a lot of tweaking that's done to make the main headliner sound as good as possible, without necessarily considering the quality of the sound of the opening bands. Our protagonists are then asked to go backstage with Clash at Demon Head, at which point we have our confrontation. Now, during the whole show, while Ramona was exchanging glances with Todd, the next evil ex, and Scott was also crossing glances at Envy, we finally have them all staring each other down. Bum, bum, bum. Which is what gives us our first taste of Todd. This ends in a bunch of backhanded comments crossing the table back and forth, the whole time with Knives not able to get over herself. Knives was definitely fangirling over Envy Adams because, I mean, she's kind of her musical idol. Telling her things like, I read your blog, you're my role model. It's really just kind of fangirling over her. Doesn't really feel like overbearingly so until she stands up. As she just put it together that Scott and Envy used to date. And she said, I've kissed the lips that have kissed yours. To which 
she has approached Envy's displeasure. She looks to Todd. Todd stands up and ruthlessly punches her so hard that her fresh, sweet blue highlights are just eradicated from her hair. I love young Neil's reaction. I love it. This double take moment, this classic cry for a help. He knocked the highlights right out of her hair. He knocked the highlights right out of her hair. Really intense. Like, that's the first time you ever see young Neil be intense about anything. I love the attention to detail in that scene, too, because they could have gone the lazy way out and just had knives without her highlights on the floor. But you can actually see the spatter. You see the blue highlight. It's on the ground. So good. So this whole time, it's just been very antagonizing, almost like challenging Scott for a confrontation. So the conflict comes to a head when Julie asks Envy if they had any fun planes while they were in Toronto, to which Todd replied very scathingly, fun in Toronto, which prompts Scott to leap to action. What a jerk. How dare you say that there's nothing fun to do in my town of Toronto. I put my finger at the Canada. So a fighting happens, which Scott seems to be losing at as far as the physical part of the fight. So he can't handle him the way he handled Matthew Patel with an all out brawl. And no, he had to outwit him. So he tries the Lucas Lee route where he challenges him to a secondary test of skill, which does not seem to go in Scott's favor. Which, granted, Aaron, like you were about to say, that last turn with the coffee may have been him handling it the way he handled Lucas, where he tried to outsmart him. I realize I stated this in the first Scott Pilgrimage, but as it goes on, it is increasingly obvious that these people are overpowering as far as Scott's skill level goes. So it's more like he has to outwit them or trick them into their own follies instead of directly defeating them with his fighting skills. I found it kind of amusing the way that while they were explaining Todd's powers, and Todd gives that whole spiel about how the other 90% of your brain being full of curds and whey. Right, W-H-E-Y. No way. Kim cuts in with, where did you learn that? Vegan Academy? And he even comes back at her with, look, lady, maybe I would listen to you if you knew the science. Right. Don't get snippy with me. I feel like that just leads you to feel like this is just Kim being sarcastic again. But then later on, they go and have Ramona explain her and Todd's background with each other. And it turns out he actually did go to Vegan Academy. He did. Absolutely, he did. If I may point out an interesting format observation. When I watched Scott Pilgrim this year, I watched it with the subtitles on. And during the base battle, it was really interesting because when Scott would start doing his riffs, the caption would be simple bass riffs. And then when Todd would do his, it would say advanced bass riffs <laughs> or something to the effect. Because if you listen to the bass riffs of both, Todd is obviously the superior bass player to Scott. So it's just another area in Scott's life where he's being outclassed by his enemies. Right before that, we also have Scott being punched into the building venue where he picks up his guitar, at which point, as you're looking from a perspective of inside the building to the hole Scott just flew through, Stephen and Kim walk by and Stephen says that the two of them are going to go ahead and go grab some pizza and for Scott to just join him whenever he's done. So this is one of two things. Either they are really just fed up with Scott's drama and not angrily, but just more dismissively would rather just go do something else while Scott handles this thing. Yeah, exactly. Like we're over it. We're over it. Or another way you can read this is that they are that confident that Scott has this. Again, with these characters and how dry they are, I think it's almost impossible to draw that distinction. So, this ends in a hilarious manner where Scott tricks Todd into drinking half and half, at which point the vegan police show up. Yes! With their index finger laser sights. 
de-veganizing index finger rays. So clutch. This part makes me ask one question. I know Scott didn't have enough information to know that Todd has already broken vegan code two times in the past prior to this one moment. Let alone that Scott even knew that there was a vegan code allowing Todd to have powers. So, his intent was to hopefully make him break the vegan code and maybe lose his powers, in which point he might be able to defeat him one-on-one. Great move, but this extra moment, I feel, is pure luck in favor of Scott and his endeavor right now. It worked in his favor. And so, Todd is de-veganized, and Scott headbutts him into a pile of coins, at which point he tells Envy that because she kicked his heart in the butt, they must be even now. Because, you know, murder totally makes stuff even. Clearly there is no murder because there is no evidence of the murder. There is a bunch of coins that will get spent. And also the vegan police walk away high-fiving despite the fact they just facilitated a murder. Yeah, they definitely... They're the vegan police. They're above the law. Yes, they were instrumental in the crime. Instrumental in the slaughter, the first-degree murder of Todd. I don't know his last name. They willingly facilitated and participated in the murder of Todd, who then became a bunch of coins, so there is no body, so there is no proof that he was murdered. Maybe he just went back to Vegan Academy. We'll respawn from a pile of coins. That great big vegan academy in the sky. Maybe there's like a coin box that he will crawl out of back at vegan academy. We don't know how veganism works other than... Gotta roll them coins, baby. As soon as you get them all rolled, you find out how much it's worth. Then just draw your pentagram and do some alchemy and poof, they're back. (laughs) You can reach out to the hosts of Banter Banter on Twitter. Find me, Manny, at Brogar, C-R-E. Aaron can be found at 8BitWizard. The 8 is Roman numerical. Find Mike at Mike8Time. That is the number 8. Or holler at our podcast page at Banter underscore cast. Or find it on Facebook at Banter Banter Cast. The art for this podcast special was created by at Pepper Troopa on Twitter. Thanks for listening to part three of the Scott Pilgrimage. We'll be back next week with part four.